the one that I think jumps out as being most most valuable to the current lifting population is it's going to be the Jefferson curl. A little bit of a misunderstanding about advanced lifting that it's just slower. It's just like, you know, beginner to intermediate to advanced. It's all the same. It just slows down. And I found that not to be true. So I want to kick things off by going back about five years when you did your first informational video, which was about building traps. Even to this day, there's a misconception that naturals can't build traps. What are they getting wrong about trap training? Okay, yeah, that, oh wow, that, he went way back. That, um, I was definitely not serious about YouTube at that time. Um, I mean, the main thing that people are not understanding about trap training is folks are, in my opinion, wanting to apply rules that might work for some other muscle groups uh, to the traps. People tend to want to use, well, in one case, you have people who want to use a lot of mind muscle connection, a lot of really strict form with, you know, fairly light weights if they're doing shrugs at all. Um, which in many cases, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Um, but if, if they are doing shrugs, if we are doing like direct, you know, shrugs of any sort, it tends to be, uh, people say do, you know, do a lot of squeeze at the top. You want to maybe, maybe get like, you know, the full rotation or something. You know, people say various things on what they think, you know, the good technique is going to be, but it tends to be something involving like a lot of squeeze and full range of motion. And that's, that's you know great advice for lots of exercises. Um, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of exercises that I would perform that way that work well that way, but that just does not seem to be the experience that most people have when it comes to building big traps. You know, without the use of steroids, like I, pretty much everyone that I've talked to, in some way recommends heavy weight. Some people recommend like heavy farmers walks. You load up the implement, get a bunch of micro contractions while you're stabilizing. That'll build big traps. Uh, Olympic lifts. You're not necessarily lifting the biggest weights ever, but you're lifting them very dynamically. Um, there's still obviously a lot of a lot of tension on the traps. Even you know just math. You know um, force is mass times uh, velocity. So obviously speed is another way to increase force. Um, some people like the heavy rack pulls. Um, I'm not a huge fan of those just for practical reasons. If you do, we're talking like heavy above the knee rack pulls, so you're only going up a couple of inches. Um, I'm not a big fan of those for practical reasons because, I mean, you're going to have to load up every plate in the gym um, just to get a good stimulus, and that's just kind of time-consuming. No, I mean, power shrugs that I like, you lo you're still going to load up a lot of plates, but, I mean, would you rather be loading up, like, seven plates or like 11 plates you know what i mean it's still a difference at that point right i mean once you're once you're talking about just a straight up rack pull you can use kind of a silly amount of weight so i mean i'm not saying it doesn't work but i mean you know like if i can if i can not make a couple more trips to the um weight tree i'll do that but it, anyway all that to say typically any any natural who's got big traps is going to just be doing something very heavy for them the traps seem to respond really well to that some people talk about stretch media, mediated hypertrophy because your traps are in a stretch, you know, at the bottom of a shrug, so you, you can stretch them with a ton of weight. I mean, I try not to get too mechanistic in this because ultimately I don't know what the mechanism exactly is, but just, you know, I, I like to, I'd rather just pool the experiences of people who have big traps and didn't use a bunch of steroids to get them that way. And you know, it tends to be a you know, heavyweight works. And, you know, some people are just, you know, very strong deadlifters. If you're, if you're just a really strong deadlifter, you're probably going to have big traps anyway, but not all of us are, you know, deadlifting 700 pounds or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and th not to say that, you know, lighter deadlifts won't do something, but if you want to get them just absolutely massive and you're not just a super strong puller off the floor, I'm not, um, you know, you need a little something extra. Now, you know, some people will say that you shouldn't even do shrugs at all. Um, you know, most of the fibers don't run vertically, yada, yada, yada. Um, I mean, A, that's just not consistent with what, you know, results people get. All these these people want to say, like, some kind of row or something is actually going to be better. I mean, in a lot of cases, their traps aren't that big. Or if they are, like, some cases they're just, okay, well, you take much steroids and do a bunch of deadlifts. So, you know, maybe, you, maybe rows fit better into your program because you're already doing vertical pulls and you're taking steroids. Maybe you just need to do more rows but for people who are just purely trying to build the traps you know heavy shrugs work um but i mean even when you're doing a heavy barbell shrug um 
with that much weight, you're actually, you're really not making a, a complete vertical pull anyway. The, the force, you're kind of, you're kind of having to lean back to balance the bar anyway. So the, the force vector is going to be a little bit for is going to be a little bit forward anyway. It's not going to be straight up and down as if you were like using a trap bar uh, when you're doing heavy barbell shrugs anyway. So I think heavy barbell shrugs are, you know, it's, it, it's simple. It makes sense. Load up a bunch of weight on the exercise and it, you know, it just works. Um, but yeah, I mean, for a long time, that was the myth that, you know, naturals could not build traps and big traps are a sign of steroid use deltoids as well. You know, those are the things that naturals supposedly can't build, but then you're, you know, you have these people telling them, okay, well, don't do heavy shrugs. Just, you know, either use paperweights or don't do shrugs at all, just do rows. And maybe that's why they're not building them. Or same thing with deltoids, you know, it's like, okay, we, uh, why can't naturals build 3D delts? Oh, it's, is it because antigen receptors in the, in the shoulders? I mean, that might be a thing, but it also might be the case that they're telling us, you know, presses, you know, strict presses aren't actually that great for shoulders. You really just want to do a bunch of lateral raises. Um, you shouldn't, like, there's no point in using in any heavy overhead movements like push presses or, um, you know, jerks. That's not a bodybuilding exercise. That's purely for guys who want to get strong. Don't waste your time with any of that. And I mean, don't even waste your time with strict presses. That's really not optimal. You really just want to do a bunch of lateral raises. And I mean, in my opinion, the lateral raise is kind of a trash movement. Um, it requires fairly lightweight, strict control, kind of almost mind muscle connection. It, you have to be fairly strict with it to get any effect, but it's not really, you don't get a whole lot of stretch on it. It just doesn't do that much. You're, there aren't too many exercises where you're going to use really light weights with a lot of control, not a lot of loading potential, not a lot of progression potential, and you're going to grow that much. If you want to do something light, you know, light with more mind muscle connection, you kind of want to get Typically, you want to get a stretch on the muscle, but that obviously doesn't work with a lateral raise because you run into your body. There, there are some ways to do it, like side lying, um, like incline lateral raises where you're kind of lying to the side. That way you get a little bit more of a stretch on it. But, um, <clears throat> you know, if all we're telling people to do is just, eh, just do lateral raises, maybe that's why people can't get big shoulders. And maybe there's some other alternatives that would work better. I spoke way too long on that, but. There For you. sure. So I, I like to use lateral raises, but I'm really specific. So I use cable and I'm doing it mm -hmm. kind of like behind my back. So I yeah, do yeah. stretch and I have a really good mind muscle connection, but it took me years to figure it out. And the vast majority, like pretty much everyone else at my gym, I look at is doing them incorrectly. And then they're like, I'm not growing my shoulders. And they may just be better off doing some larger compound movements mm -hmm. that they don't have to be so methodical about the technique to nail it down. Right. Yeah. I mean, I like, I like the behind the back variation because that does get you some stretch on there. And that, I feel like that kind of just, that kind of justifies it. Yeah. I would say it kind of justifies having to be really strict and controlled because when you're, when you are trying to get that stretch, I mean, with a lot of mobility training, it's like that too. You have to really put your mind in the muscle and just make sure that you're stretching exactly what you want. Um, you know, that then, then you're getting a good stimulus from that stretch. I'm, I don't want to get too into the stretch mediated hypertrophy debate because I don't, I don't like to talk too me mechanistically. I'm not seeing what's going on in the muscle. I kind of prefer more just be observational. I do, we do this, we see this happens, but I mean, it's pretty well known throughout um, you know, bodybuilding history that getting a good stretch on the muscle under load tends to result in growth. So yeah, I think I, I really like that variation a lot more too. Something that just lets you actually get stretched. I mean, messing around with light weights and kind of a medium range is typical. There aren't too many exercises that are kind of like in that mid range with really light weight that you can't really progress very well that work too well. I don't think. Yeah. I definitely agree on the trap side of things that most people are not using enough weight to build the traps. Mm -hmm. And I think the advice that you don't need to do direct trap training is not the greatest advice across the board. Yeah. And it's something I consistently hear is like, Oh, if it's a lagging part, work on it. But it's like, well, it's kind of a lagging part for most people. So they should be yeah. training it. Yeah. I, I mean, the, yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say is like, if you, maybe you don't need to do it right at first because I mean, like the heavy shrugs that I like to do, I don't recommend people do until they have their deadlift and a fairly decent um, weight, just, just to make sure they can brace and everything before they just go loading 
a ton of weight because you, you can get you can get to silly poundages and if you're not bracing well enough you might hurt yourself but yeah i mean there, there's so many muscles that they say oh you don't need to actually directly do that well why not do you not need that muscle to be strong do you not need that muscle to work like these are the muscles you should trade and these are not right like yeah i mean i, I know for a while bodybuilders thought traps were like on aesthetic and they would make you look like you had narrow shoulders and whatnot mm. oh that was silly um I, I get into a lot of old school stuff and, you know, I, I like a lot of old school techniques, but that was actually something that some of the old school bodybuilders, including Steve Reed's thought, like developing traps is bad. It's going to make you look really narrow. Oh yeah. Yeah. Steve Reed's actually believed that if you developed your traps too much, you would look narrow. And if you look at him, he did actually didn't develop, he didn't develop his traps that much. And I think it's a mistake. I think he, there's nothing that could have made his shoulders look narrow. The guy was just built wide. And he had great genetics, you know? But, um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, same thing you get with the obliques, um, you know, some other body parts people think are, you know, on aesthetic, but I think you should just develop all of it. Yeah. Do you have any advice for someone who wants to build their traps, but maybe doesn't spend enough time deadlifting or doesn't want to build up their deadlift? Or do you think that's kind of a requirement to kind of like that's stage one. And then to get to stage two and do power shrubs, you need to. Be able yeah. to so you can brace your core. Yeah, I would I would do that. I mean, if you don't want to do that, you can do um you can do power cleans, hang power cleans. I mean, obviously that's a little bit more technical, although you can I mean, go to any football gym in in America and you'll see some very non-technical um power cleans that are nevertheless very effective. But um yeah, I mean power cleans work, but either way you're gonna be um I mean you're going to be accomplishing the same end, but yeah, I mean, I would say building traps is the easy part. Um, building up the foundation to be able to do that is the hard part. Cause I mean, at the end of the day, like that's kind of what the big traps are symbolizing. Like they, they, they convey, you know, the, the yoke look and basis or of power, but I mean, you kind of have to have, you kind of have to have the go to go with the show, if that makes sense. And, I, I don't think you're going to be able to just safely, you know, throw around a bunch of weight if you don't have the fundamentals. Uh, I mean, you know, it's not maybe, you know, maybe um, I, I'm getting into some direct neck training. I think that's, that's great. I think you can probably get a lot of uh, benefit out of that, uh, uh, you know, for your neck, it's going to probably benefit your upper traps as well. So that would, that would be um, something else that might be effective for that area. But yeah, I mean, I think I think it's just part of the process. You know, you want the strength, you want the appearance of strength. Why, why don't we build them all? You know, it's, it, it's going to take some time, but that's. I mean, this this whole thing is going to be slow. What's the rush, right? Do the foundational yeah. work first, and then then build up the traps when you've done that work, right? And especially oh, yeah. if you're a novice, like still work on the fundamentals first, and then yeah. work on everything else. It, it and that you know people think that you know people think it taking time is a bad thing, but you know, you get, you get into it enough. You realize that the process of, you know, making progress is what you like, you know, just getting up to a certain high point and then you can't progress from there is actually a lot less fun than just being in, you know, in, in that point where you're making progress and you know, at event, eventually it gets to the point where things that are hard, things that you're not as good at almost become opportunities. Like for me, I'm kind of enjoying hip mobility, which is weird because I hate hip mobility my hips are not mobile and that's hard for me, but it's also something where I can actually make progress. So, you know, it doesn't seem like the coolest thing, but Hey, I can still make progress there. So that's, you know, that's a, that's actually a good thing. Yeah. There's diminishing returns, right? So when you yeah. find something new, it's exciting because you can progress in the gym, but it's also cool because it's like a new topic that you get to research and mess around with and test yeah. out. Right. And I think if you are someone who's kind of, long-term oriented like that's exciting mm -hmm. as well oh definitely and then then you get to come back to what you were doing before and see what the new progress in that new area unlocks and you might be surprised what you could do now that you couldn't before because you know one piece was missing now you put that piece in and you know suddenly new doors open up it's really cool awesome so i want to move on and talk about your natural status so you've mentioned your reason for staying natural isn't a moral one but it's more that getting big on steroids has already been done before. So can you maybe talk through what people have to gain by staying natural? Yeah. I mean, obviously it's, it's going to be healthier. Um, I mean, that, that part, that part's been done to death. I think we all know that because 
Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much that's the only dimension anyone really talks about when it comes to should you stay natural or not. It's like it's it's kind of presented as do you want to stay healthy and get no, you know, small gains or do you want to potentially get some side effects, but get better gains? And that's kind of, yeah, it's very um, it's a very one dimensional conversation. And I mean, yeah, with, with, with what I was getting at in that post, it's like it's not it's, you know, there's no there's no sense of discovery or pushing boundaries and enhanced bodybuilding because it's just been done. You know, like we've we pretty much figured out everything that we um, we've put we've pushed that envelope about as far as it goes. I mean, you get mass monsters looking just absolutely insane. I, I don't I mean, is it possible to push even beyond what they're doing it, at a certain point? You're not even, it would be hard. Like if you take, say, Jake Cutler, for example, he's you know huge mass monster. Like if someone was. If someone was able to get like, you know, ten percent more muscular than Jay Cutler, would you even know? Like, would, would you even be able to tell or care? Like, at a certain point, it all just looks like these guys are just already freaking huge. So, where's the boundary to push? And you know, would you want to? Right? Like, because most people, I'm not trying, I'm not, I'm not bashing them, but most people don't want to look like that anyway. Um, you know, a lot of people like say the golden era look like Arnold, uh, you know, Frank Zane, guys like that. But then if you just try to shoot for that, like they do with the classic physique um, division, then you're kind of, you know, it's almost like it, it's lost a little bit of the soul of bodybuilding. Because back in the day, those guys were trying to push. They were pushing the envelope. You know, Tom Platts, you know, you watch his workouts. He's in there just killing it, trying to, you know, bring something that nobody's ever seen before. And now you get the classic physique guys. And I mean, they look good, but it's just kind of like, OK, we could get this huge, but we're going to instead stay this big. So we're really not pushing the envelope at all. We just want to look pretty. And I mean, the, you know, it's, it's a marketable physique, but it doesn't have that. Um, it doesn't have that, you know, sense of exploration and excitement um, that the golden era did. And, and in my opinion, the only thing that really does have that excitement is, um, you know, natural bodybuilding. Because, you know, as soon as steroids came out in the 60s, everybody jumped on them. And, you know, it, hey, it's this new thing. We're seeing physiques like never before. I mean, just look at, you know, the first, probably the first big steroid champion bill pearl i mean you look at his arms it's like wow this is something we've never seen before i mean as great as people were before then then you look at that tricep shot of bill pearl it's like what is this you know, and, <laughs> you know, well, you know I, I know why they all jumped on it's like oh wow we're, we can do things no one's ever seen before and you know from the you know from this from the 50s to the 70s it's just like night and day you're just in this whole new um whole new uh area to explore and that's exciting but you know then we just kind of i think we kind of skipped just really pushing natural bodybuilding as far as it could go. Or, you know, I mean, can, can anyone get bigger than someone like, say, John Grimmick? I don't know. But I don't feel like that's been, certainly it hasn't been explored as much recently as the enhanced side. So that's, I, yeah, I think that's more exciting. You know, when you see someone that you genuinely believe is natural, like uh, like GBS getting those crazy 18-inch arms, his tricep looks wild, you know, it's like, oh, wow, that's, I didn't think that was possible. That's cool. You know, like that's, that's way more exciting than some, you know, yet some other guy just getting to like 280 pounds on the Olympia stage. I mean, I'm not bashing them, but like, okay, we, we've been seeing that, you know, I, like, I think no one, like, maybe this is, I mean, this is just, this is just me kind of speculating, but it kind of seemed like nobody cared about natural bodybuilding until the mass monster thing happened. Like no one, no one cared about natural bodybuilding in the eighties. They didn't care that anything was on steroids because the guys were just, you know, looking really cool up there on stage. And I don't think anyone cared about natural bodybuilding until it got to the point where the, like the top guys were just like, okay, that's too much. No one wants to look like that. Is there another way that we can do bodybuilding but still be taken seriously? That's kind of how I, I see it. Um, I mean, then there's as far as other reasons for staying natty. It's just like also, like, do you really want to be? Do you really want you know, to be dependent on something like that? Do you really want something outside of your direct control to be that important to you? Like, that's kind of, that's a, that's a big commitment. I mean, you, the way you look, the way you feel, everything is now dependent on you being able to pay for something, you know, what, what can that get you into? Um, your defend, you know, it's, it's dependency. And I mean, there've been plenty of, um, plenty of rumors about bodybuilders over the years having to do a lot of things that they may not have wanted to do to get their their cycle that's that's not good um it's just in general it's just like a do you really want 
your masculinity to be a subscription service. That's, I mean, I'm not saying no one should ever do it, but that's, I mean, that, that's, that's a big thing to think, to take into consideration. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm now I'm committing to, um, you know, I'm dependent on these drugs to be what I want to be for the rest of my life. That's, that's a lot to commit to. Um, you, you, you're, you are giving up, you know, some degree of freedom, I think in a lot of cases to do that. Yeah, and, I, agree. I think, I think you are giving up freedom. I like your quote around the subscription service. I've never heard that before. I think that's a good angle. Um, so, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw out some quotes you've said in the past and just tell me your first take on it or the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, so the first one is don't be a specialist in the gym. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, if obviously you have to specialize if you're competing at a particular sport, uh, to a certain degree, although even, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of actual competitors are going to do well by branching out. But yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're trying to be a specialist in the gym, you're going to hit diminishing returns on whatever you're specializing in. Um, you'll get to the point where you're overstressing all the same areas that you constantly are pounding. You're, you're going to get to the point where most of the actual progress you make on whatever you're specializing in is the result of, you know, practice peaking, a lot of things that don't transfer over to anything else. So let's say you just are super focused on your back squat, bench press and sumo deadlift. I mean, you'll definitely get to the point where like, a sumo deadlift PR doesn't necessarily translate to any other strength in any other area. You're just getting better at sumo deadlift. And probably in the process, just constantly stressing those same areas, they could probably use a break anyway, um, versus you know, using a much more diverse or focusing on a much more diverse uh, array of exercises. You know, you're not going to be just getting like peak PRs. You're going to actually be getting stronger. You're going to be using multiple modalities to build up, you know, various abilities that can then translate over to other things. Um, yeah, so I, I think in, in general, you know, specialization is probably not a great idea unless you're a high level competitive athlete that obviously has to specialize in that one thing. Awesome. So the next one is the first rule of incorporating old time exercises into your training is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's that's something that um, I like to emphasize. I'm I'm trying to. I'm trying to add tools to people's toolbox. And I think there are some wonderful tools that people are, you know, underutilizing now, but that doesn't mean let's throw everything out that we're doing. That's currently working. I mean, you know, the golden rule in fitness is like, you know, if you're, if you're getting gains, like keep milking them, like whatever's working, don't, don't stop. And I, I'm not trying to tell people throw out something that's working just because something else is novel or cool. Um, I, but you know, that being said, there's going to come a time in your training where what you're doing yeah, you know, stops working. You're going to hit the point of diminishing returns. You're going to hit the point where you do kind of have to be a specialist to push what you're doing further. And at that point, you're probably not getting a lot of general gains. And at that point, it might make sense to rotate in. Um, it might be an old school lift. It might be just another lift that you haven't tried from the you know the current era. But definitely at that point, uh, it might make sense to shift your focus a little bit. Yeah, I think I heard you say this like on another podcast, which is like. I'm trying to present a toolbox. So do what you want a la carte as opposed to providing a full training style and system. Oh yeah, exactly. I mean, cause I know with, with my audience, I think my audience tends to be um, definitely a higher level than I'm, I'm not really trying to chase the beginner audience. And I think, you know, from the comments I get, you know, I have a lot of people who are coaches, fitness professionals, athletes, people who in a lot of domains of fitness are, you know, more knowledgeable than myself. You know, I'm like, I, in, in a lot of cases, you know, I'm, I, I have people who are, you know, world-class coaches, you know, watching my stuff. I'm not trying to tell anybody how to train, but, you know, I may have pushed one particular exercise farther than they have or farther than they should. Like let's take Jefferson curls, for example, that's one of the exercises that I push. I mean, I've, you know, I've pushed them as far as anyone that I know of in the current era and that's because, you know, I'm not a pro athlete. I don't have a career to, you know, screw up if I'm, um, if I end up getting injured, which I haven't, but if I were to, it wouldn't be the end of the world. You know, that's data for, um, you know, some coach to say, okay, well, maybe he got away with this, you know, that gives me kind of a frame of reference where, I, so I can see, you know, 
what I need to give my athletes. Right. But anyway, yeah, so that's, so I'm just trying to give tools. Um, you know, I know most of the people that are, or at least, you know, a lot of the people that are following me don't need me to just reinvent the wheel and just teach them how to train. They, that's not really where I can provide value. I'd rather just share my experiences with certain tools that you can then add. And I mean, you know how you, you know how you like to train. Let me just give you some insights into this one tool, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the appropriate messaging for like late intermediate advanced lifters anyways, mm -hmm. right? It's like, what additional things can I experiment with and test and see what other people have done and then leverage that, but I'm not going to yeah. scratch, right? And that's such an underserved market too. I mean, because everyone does target the beginners. I mean, it's, that's the biggest audience. You make the most money if you target to them. And, you know, also, you know, I think that a lot of people are you know, maybe correctly concerned that if we talk about things that are too advanced, it might confuse people, people might get hurt. But what that does, I mean, it really does leave a lot of good people who do all the right things, follow all the good beginner advice, you know, do the consistency, you know, do the basics, do everything they're told. Kind of, you know, without, without too much. It's like there's a big gulf between like, okay, you're a beginner all this content is targeted at you. Can you please be consistent and just go to the gym? Please, please be consistent. Please be consistent. Stick to the basics. And then, okay, you get through that. There's kind of this gap. And then up here is like, okay, now you have to specialize in a particular sport. You could be a power lifter, Olympic lifter, strong man, bodybuilder. And, you know, yes, specialize in the sport, most likely take something and do that. But there's this like, there's this big middle ground between those two. And I think that, had, you know, could stand to be built out a little bit. I think that's where a lot of people get stuck too, right? They're seeing all this progression, things are going easy, and then they get stuck at kind of some point in the intermediate stage. And then because they're stuck and it's hard to find good information, they lose that motivation and love for lifting. So they kind of just yeah. you know, the same lifting, they stop tracking their lifts. Like they just don't take it as seriously then because they think there's huge diminishing gains, but they're not at the advanced level where the actual diminishing gains kind of right. happen they're in the intermediate. They should still be able to progress yeah. week to week or at least month to month at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I was there too. It's just, and that's, that's kind of how it, how it goes. You, um, yeah. You, and, and, you know, when, once you get to that point, you have so many messages about, you know, natural limits and, you know, genetics and all this stuff to give you a narrative to explain why you're no longer progressing in conjunction with the fact that information about more advanced strategies that would work for you, you know, not being available and people telling you, Oh, well, that stuff doesn't just, just do the basics. You know, like the, the, the pros are just doing the basics really well. So just stick with the basics and be more consistent. You know, you, you get all that together and you have the perfect storm. And it's going to convince a lot of people that, okay, this is as far as I can go. And then they get demoralized and either stop taking it seriously, or maybe that's when they start experimenting with drugs. But yeah, that that's kind of, I mean, that, that's, yeah, I think it's a big problem. Awesome. I got one more here. I have a rule that when I fail to make progress on a lift two sessions in a row, I take it out of rotation and focus on something. I have more room to make improvements. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's only for more of a big lift where, um, you know, I, where I would expect to see that, you know, if we're talking about an isolation, I'm not expecting um, progress all the time. But for typically for a big lift that I'm doing, um, I want to be able to at least add, it doesn't have to be like, I don't have to add like a ton of weight or something, but I, I might add a rep, uh, might add a second set afterward or third, you know, whatever. It might be another set with decent performance. It might be just another rep. It might be some weight. It might be you know, some, some kind of progress. I would, I like to see progress because typically in my training, I'm not just doing something that I've been doing for the last five years. Um, I am trying to get exposure to, you know, newer stimulus and not, um, not just run things into the ground. So, you know, obviously if you've been doing a particular exercise for the last five years, that will be unrealistic. So that's kind of in the context of my training. And you know, obviously with something light, like a lighter isolation, certainly I can't expect that. But you know, typically with a big lift that I'm focusing on, I do want to see that. And if I'm not making some kind of fairly, uh, you know, any kind of progress whatsoever, um, it, there's probably something I should be focusing on that's different. And that that that's not what you hear from a lot of people. A lot of people are going to say be more patient. And there's there you know there's reasons and context for why they're saying that. But with the style of training I'm doing. Um, 
I, if I'm not able to progress something, there's probably some lower hanging fruit that I could be switching to, which doesn't mean switch like every, it doesn't mean switch, you know, every day, you still have to train something for a while. And, you know, what, what this will look like in practice is usually I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll focus on a particular exercise, um, usually for a couple of months, like this, this, um, this last bulk, I did uh, snatch grip deadlifts as one of my main exercises in rotation. And each, uh, each time I hit them, I was able to make some progress just because, you know, I haven't done snatch grip deadlifts. So, I mean, it's, yeah, that in that context, it's kind of a reasonable, um, it's kind of a reasonable assumption. It wouldn't always hold for everybody else, but it does work for me. And I think that's something that, um, it, you know, more advanced lifters ought to look at a little bit more. Um, there's kind of a myth about, not a myth, but there's a little bit of a misunderstanding about advanced lifting that it's just slower. It's just like, you know, beginner to intermediate to advanced. It's all the same. It just slows down. And I found that not to be true. Like, you know, if you just do the same things, you'll make progress, but much, much slower. Um, I found that it's, the, the, it's not that slower. It's just like things stop working. So it's, it's kind of more either things work or they don't. So if you just, if you just keep like doing the same thing and thinking, okay, maybe there'll be progress eventually, um, you might just not get progress. And on the flip side, even if you are overall an advanced lifter, you might find something where you're still able to make fairly rapid progression on, and you actually do see, you know, no more noticeable um, increases. So that's, that's kind of the mindset behind that. Yeah, I think it comes back to when you said don't be a specialist, right? So if you're mm -hmm. only doing three lifts, eventually you're going to kind of plateau and you can try oh, yeah. to keep pushing through that forever. Or you can just alternate exercises and build that mm -hmm. up. Right. All yeah, right. And I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, just trying to stick with it, especially on those on those uh, plateaued exercises you've been doing forever. Any progress that you do end up making, it's not going to translate over to anything else most likely, whereas... Put, I've, I've seen in other lifts, you know, pushing for progress each week on, um, not each week, I was doing it like a three week rotation, but each session on, um, on, um, snatch group deadlifts, you know, I'm, I'm seeing it, I'm seeing the results already in other lifts. So awesome. I just started reading your book. It's pretty fantastic so far. So I did want to know what's your Mount Rushmore, your four favorite old school lifts that you think everyone should try? Everyone should try. Well, Four favorite, are, are we talking about, um, as far as, as far as function, I mean, the one that I think jumps out as being most, most valuable to the current lifting population, it's, it's going to be the Jefferson curl. I mean, that's, you know, it's something that you can, you can teach to a healthy senior citizen who may be, you know, fairly frail, but, you know, is healthy. I don't recommend jumping into Jefferson curls with any kind of back injuries. Uh, without first, you know, getting uh, actually checked out by a PT, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna prescribe um, exercises to fix injuries. That's above my pay grade, so get checked out. But if you're healthy, then it's it's all about load management, all load management, and um, just uh, managing the range of motion. Because with the Jefferson curl, it's based on you and your range of motion. You you get down as far as you can. That's your range of motion. You you bend your spine as much as you can. That's your range of motion, right? You can do it. You can start out with just body weight, and you're basically in a pike stretch. If that feels good, you can you can do as little as you know, grab a 2.5 pound plate. Okay, that's a little bit of load. Five pound plate, 10 pound. You know, so it, it can be loaded to anyone in the range of motion. Unlike a deadlift, which you know comes from the floor, it's it's got kind of an objective outside starting point. Jefferson curl molds to whoever is doing it, right? So that's it's got benefit from everyone from. Um, you know, someone who's just looking to avoid a little bit of injury, just build up a little resilience in those areas all the way up to elite athletes. You know, I think this is probably a, a fantastic tool for say wrestlers who need to be some of the strongest, most mobile athletes on the planet. You know, you already see the, the, um, the, you know, the Soviet wrestlers certainly were doing the, um, the uh, Zercher deadlifts, which yeah. is a similar movement. I think, you know, the Jefferson curl is a little bit more mobility focused, but yeah, I mean, the Jefferson Curl just has so much benefit for everyone from a senior citizen to a bodybuilder. It's, in my opinion, the best spinal erector builder to obviously a lot of athletes could stand to benefit from it. So that's that's definitely one. Um, 
as far as Mount Rushmore in terms of cool, it's definitely the bent press because I mean, it's, it's not for everyone. Not everyone's going to be able to do it. In fact, most people probably starting out would, wouldn't even have the mobility to immediately do it. That would have to be worked on. But when you do, when you do, um, build that, it gives you an opportunity to just do an unprecedented feat of strength. It's, it's for those of you who haven't heard of it before, it's a one-handed lift where you're essentially pinning your, your elbow to your body and bending under it. You're, you're side bending under the weight in order to lock your elbow out using the strength of your lats, obliques, total body rather than arm strength. So you're bending under the weight until you have a straight arm, then standing up with the weight. And this, this allows just completely unprecedented weights to be lifted. Uh, the record, I believe, is Arthur Saxon's 371, I believe, is Saxon's record. So that's a 371-pound, one-armed overhead lift. It's pretty crazy. Um, that even in pro strongman, where some of the, um, the body weights are 400 pounds or over, uh, there, there are no one-hand lifts that are that heavy in modern pro strongman. I think like the lower threes are as heavy as it goes with some of the surface dumbbell lifts, but you had basically a 205, 210 pound man in what, what was it, the teens or twenties lifting more overhead with one hand than our modern strongmen who are literally double that size or more. So that's pretty impressive. Um, and you know, we're, we're not, we don't have anyone um, getting quite that heavy now. We're, we're getting some people into the 200s. Um, and you know, back in the day, it was seen as something where if you practice, if you're just a, an enthusiast lifter, not necessarily a pro athlete or anything, but if you're an enthusiast lifter who practices the lift seriously, you'll probably be able to lift your body weight uh, in a couple of years. That was kind of the standard. And, you know, tons of people um, who, whose names we've never heard were lifting 200 pounds or more overhead with one hand back in the day, lifting their body weight overhead with one hand back in the day. So I think that's a really cool thing. I mean, maybe we're not all going to be Arthur Saxon and lift like 370, but I think a lot of people with proper training could lift their own body weight at least overhead. And that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, I think that's a, that, that's a feat most people have never even considered possible for them, but it, it absolutely is. So that's, you know, for the more, obviously it's not, it's not got the same, like, um, you know, it, it's not as applicable to as many people, but for the serious strength enthusiast, that is a pretty cool feat to shoot for. And in the process, you'll have to actually work on some mobility and you'll probably be a lot better for it in, you know, in the long run anyway. Uh, let's see what else. Um, as far as just general functional strength, I know that, I know that's a, um, I know that's a, uh, kind of a taboo in, um, in fitness that's or you know you're not supposed to say functional strength because a bunch of like silly people who do kind of silly things like to say it but i i like it i think there's nothing wrong with wanting to be functional um, oh it's all good <laughs> and if you're if you're using a barbell and not any kind of specialized implements it's hard to uh it's hard to beat the full zercher cycle now with searchers there's a lot of um there's a lot of different variations of the searcher so let me explain what that is the full search cycle is what you've probably seen. You deadlift the floor conventional or maybe a, a mild sumo off the ground to your knees, put the bar on your knees, hook your elbows under it and stand up, right? I mean, it's hard to get more functional than that. You're basically doing a ton of strongman movements with a bar. I mean, I've used movements very much like that to just move stuff in real life. It, you know, it happens. You know, I, I, I have to say, I think working up to a pretty heavy full search cycle I think that's going to be a little bit more functional than just, you know, leg press machine. I'm sorry. It is actually probably going to be more functional for your life. You know, and, you know, it, it's a it's a great exercise as well. It allows you to search your squat, which is a, it can be kind of a hybrid hinge squat that can, you know, build some, um, you know, build some, some backup while also getting you a good quad stimulus. Or you can make it a really squatty squat, a really quad dominant squat by just staying really upright. It actually makes... It can actually make it just a really fantastic quad exercise where you're just getting a really good pure quad stimulus. So, it, you know, we've got we've got function, we've got bodybuilding, we've got, and it's it's fairly accessible. Most people who are physically fit will have no problem doing it. So that's you know that's a a good combination, and and it looks you know if you push the weight a lot, it looks really cool. It's a fun feat of strength. So we've got kind of that nice balance of functionality, bodybuilding, feat of strength. It's just. 
it's kind of good to be able to pick something up off the ground, reposition it, to carry it at a higher hold, and just carry it around, right? Awesome. So that's 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 what number three. Um, three yeah. Let's see, what am I going to pick for four? I'm I'm trying. I, I have a tier list in the back of my book where I rank them, but that I'm, I'm using a little bit different criteria there, so this isn't going to directly mirror that as much. Um, I'm just going to I'm just going to throw in the one hand deadlift, and the reason I'm throwing that in is it's a phenomenal feat of strength. Herman Gorner did a, I think we his record. Supposedly he may have done more than this, but there's some debate on that. But his record was like 664 pounds. One hand, just a barbell, one hand, 300 or 664 pounds. It's a pretty good feat of strength. Um, but we've had a lot, we've had a lot of modern people get fairly close to that. Um, Joey Keeley did uh 550 to full lockout, got uh six plates all the way to his knees recently, and he's like he's what his early 20s, very impressive young lifter. So that's it, it's something that's fairly accessible like it, obviously you're you're going to have to use hook grip like an olympic lifter that's where you um you wrap your uh your thumb around the bar first and then wrap your fingers over it to secure keep it from rolling out of your hand but when you do that you lift a surprising percentage of your two-hand deadlift and that's a that's a fun feat of strength for a lot of people but it's also got obviously a ton of um a ton of developmental benefit as well it's a good overload for for your upper back because you know one half of your back is being subjected to greater loads um you're having to deal with it a little bit of an asymmet asymmetric load. Um, you're having to, um, you're getting some lateral movement as well. Typically we only work, um, you know, we're not, you know, we're not bending side to side. It's not, it's not quite as much as a suitcase deadlift, which is also a, you know, a good lift, but you're getting some, you're getting some side to side stabilization work. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a good, it's another good combination of um, accessible, Functional and valuable, you know, good developmental benefit, but also just a really cool feat of strength once you get good at it. And I think as far as one of the things about a lot of the old school lifts is the the level of skill, mobility, and whatnot that you have to do to actually perform it is it can be intimidating. Like the bent press is just hard to get into. Well, the one hand deadlift is pretty simple. It, it's not that comfortable on your thumb, but you know anybody who wants to dip the toes in the water can pick up a bar with one hand. You don't have to have any special um, you know, gymnastic ability. So it's a very accessible way to push yourself and say, and, you know, probably surprise yourself with what you can do. You, I think a lot of lifters out there would be really surprised with how much they could end up, you know, lifting one handed if they trained it. So it's a good, good little entry point, I think. Yeah. I just, it feels like people don't do one handed work and there are some benefits to, to giving it a go. Absolutely. And I mean, one thing that I've noticed that will surprise people, you know, if, if you're a, Going from um, always pulling conventional to mixing it up with some one hand, it can actually be easier on the back. I mean, you're using less weight overall, and you're also changing up the, changing up the stress a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just having little little changes in those stress points, you, you know, you might you might have one day where conventional deadlifts feel really bad, and something like a one hand deadlift, a Jefferson deadlift, or a hack deadlift feels fine, just because you're not changing it that much. You're still pulling something heavy off the ground, but you are changing the movement just enough that you're not hammering yourself in the exact same way. And that can be all that you need to go from, I feel bad. I can't pull from the floor today to, Oh yeah, um, I, I can still get a good session. in. so it's just, you know, more tools in the toolbox. For sure. Two things. I thought you were going to say a pullover, which you didn't. And then the second is I went down the rabbit hole on Arthur Saxton and Eugene Sandow. Cause I saw mm -hmm. a post about it. That was, that was interesting little piece of history there. I didn't know about. Yeah, but I mean, pullovers are, I think pullovers are fantastic developmentally. I kind of, I think they have a, com a great combination of bodybuilding and health benefits. And I mean, I guess they can be a feat of strength. I mean, some of the, some of the silver era guys would do insanely heavy pullovers. That, that's why I didn't mention it for you, just because like, the way you presented it at Mount, Mount Rushmore, I was trying to add some more like fun feat of strength, which no, I makes mean, sense. Yeah, for yeah, sure. I mean, pullovers can be, but I, I see them as more developmental and I mean, a lot of people will disagree that they, oh, they don't actually build lats. I'm actually getting, in, I'm actually going to do a debate on that next week, which should be fun. Um, but uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely pro pullover. But um, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I wish I could list all these exercises. I like them all. But there can only be four, right? Yeah. So, all right. Uh, fact or fiction? You used to go by the name Dorbra. Oh wow. Yeah, that was 
Yeah, I mean, I posted I posted on um on Fit back in the day, the 4chan slash Fit, and you know you'd have you'd have like trip codes, and I I did that. That was that was way back. I that was back when like Z's was alive. RIP. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that was, that, was, that was way back. Where'd that name come from? Someone said I look like a door. <laughs> yeah, you know, like door block. You're like door. I have kind of a blocky build. I don't have that. I don't have that like that narrow midsection. So I, someone said I look like a door. So I, hmm. all right, door block. That's hilarious. Okay, so you've mentioned uh, in the past that you've done some time learning about statistics and research. So what's your first reaction when you see an exercise science study where it's always N equals 10 and they say that they're trained lifters, but they can bench like 150 pounds? It's like, yeah, it's just, that's not how, I mean, my, yeah, my, so my, my training is in psychology and that would just not fly there. You can't publish a study with 10 people. That's, I mean, you learn in undergrad, like, I mean, 30, 30 is kind of the rule of thumb. Like that's kind of the rock bottom bare minimum. You need 30 for adequate statistical power. Although there's a lot of argument that, that maybe that number should be a lot higher, actually as high as 100. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you're like, you're so far below the bare minimum standards. Like why even publish? And that wouldn't get published in most fields. Um, the standards are too high and that that doesn't work. I mean, most, most of the time, even if you have it, a decent finding it, just by the way these statistics work you're not you may not find a significant result even if there is one at that power level there's just too much chance that some outliers can impact the overall result you're getting i mean there are reasons that we have you know rules and if you if you're not following the rules like you can't expect it to work properly you know we call it statistical power and it's kind of like if you don't have enough people in your test, it's almost like trying to run a power drill when you don't have any batteries. You know, you have to have power to use that tool, right? Um, you can't just, oh well, I'm doing my best. Like, you know, a, a good a good analogy I have is like a diesel truck. A diesel truck's an awesome way to transport stuff across the country, right? It's it's a great tool. It's objectively much better than horses. Like you can transport loads much better than horses, right? But if you don't have any diesel, and all you have some gr some grass, you might want to just go ahead and use the horse anyway, because your diesel truck is not going to work. You have to have the prerequisites to be able to use a certain tool. So it, it, it seems like, um, I mean, it seems like the culture in, in fitness science is just like, hey, we're just going to do do our best and, and that's good enough. But that's like, there's no other, I don't think there's any other scientific field where the standard is just do your best and we'll get it published, you know? So you know, when people want to say science based, it's like, would any like would this pass in any other scientific field? Like, are geologists or chemists going to look at this and say, "Oh yeah, this is this is this is um, yeah, this is legit"? Probably not. So that's and, and yeah, as far as as far as the um, the um, yeah the other issue you brought up um, is basically an issue of, of scientific validity. If if you have a population that isn't like the population that um, you know that you're trying to draw inferences about. Like, let's say you want to make a conclusion about advanced lifters, intermediate lifters, etc., and your population is a bunch of beginners. Is it fair to assume that you know whatever you find in those beginners is going to is going to apply to the other population? Not necessarily. Um, and it, you know, people want to talk about you can't use anecdotes, but in other fields where you have something that perhaps it's hard to study as, you know, a randomized control trial because you don't have enough people, they'll do case studies. Like you'll have, that you have someone with like a rare disease, a rare mental disorder, et cetera. And you have case studies. You'll have, you'll have them just describe in as much detail um, that, you know, descriptively, you know, what, what's going on with this particular person. Um, and that might be seen as a, a better source of information um, about that particular issue than some kind of trial that isn't on people that have that exact condition. So like there is actually a complete, a complete scientific precedent for taking the word of an advanced lifter. If you want to make um, inferences about advanced lifters over a, an, an actual experiment with novices, you know, and that's something that 
uh, you, that's something that I think is a big misunderstanding that you just like anecdote is always inferior to experiment. It's, it's, it's not, you know, there are other considerations. Yeah, absolutely. I was speaking with someone and we had an interesting conversation because I said we did research at Google and we did experiments, but we would do it with like tens of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the feedback is like, oh yeah, but you guys don't have control groups like we do. I'm like, of course we do. What do you mean? Of course we have control groups. Like it's, it's Google. Why would we not do that? Right? Like, and we have a ton of scale so you can do things kind of quantifiably, but we would never look at 10 users or even hundred users. Right. right. And we would look at uh, the same type of thing, right? We wouldn't look at uh, someone onboarding the app the same way as a power user of spreadsheets. Right. If it's mm -hmm. someone's a power user, that would be the equivalent of the advanced lifter. Mm -hmm. And we'd look at them separately. And even still, there was bias in the data and the conversation. Right. So it's right. it's not as crystal clear as I guess people who don't have any background in this think it mm -hmm. is, where they just say research equals fact. It's, yeah. it, it's more like you need to be able to interpret it and think critically um, and just understand mm -hmm. kind of what the framework is. And a lot of the research is good, but it's not all equal. Yeah. And I mean, it's just seeing the back end of it. You do see uh, just how much control researchers have or how much opportunity researchers have to monkey around with things. The most advanced thing I ever got into was factor analysis. And I'm not I never got good at it. Um, that was that was kind of where I kind of checked out and like really stopped caring at all. But even there, it was very clear, even with that level, which isn't like it certainly is not the most nearly the most advanced statistics out there. It was just very clear how much control the researcher has, how, how much ability to just monkey around with things to try to get the results to work out in a way that's interesting. Because I mean, in psychology, it's all about finding a novel, interesting find. So, you know, in a lot of cases, what they would do with something like that is just get some data and then like kind of just play around with a different, with analyzing in a couple of different ways and see if we can find anything interesting out of that. And then um, make the story uh, make up a story to <laughs> go along with the data that we that we found, but it, it's very it, it is very clear that there's just a lot of ways to monkey around with things. I don't think they're doing that so much in sports science. I think I, I think with them it's less like with, with psychologists they're like they're just dishonest. You know they have high standards on paper. I mean I'm I, like that I, I, and I'm not I'm not bashing them. Like they have they have a it's a nasty system. Publish or perish. Like you're talking about somebody's life. You're you're talking about somebody getting fired from the job, having to move, having to try to support their family somehow. That's that's a lot of pressure to be under. So I'm not blaming these people, but in psychology, like the thing is there are going to be very high standards on paper, but people are just going to do what they have to do to meet that standard, even if it means completely fabricating their data. We've seen that. Just taking a data set that you have and monkeying around with it till you find some kind of finding and then coming up with, uh, you know, a hypothesis. <laughs> To go with that finding that you you know all sorts of stuff like that so that that that's what happens i think in some of the sciences that try on paper to um have higher standards but obviously when you're under that much pressure you might do the wrong thing i think with i think with sports science though it's just like we're not going to do that we're just going to have no standards and you can just get published with like whatever so just oh yeah oh, you got 10 people yeah yeah we got you you know we'll, we'll um <laughs> yeah go ahead go ahead we'll publish you yeah, I think a lot of the times it's exactly that, right? Like they get a bunch of different pieces of data and they find the one that makes sense for them because in incentive drives behavior, right? So in the tech world, it's like, I want more employees under me or I want to get promoted. So then you mm -hmm. make decisions based on that. Um, I, I don't think it's fabricated, but it's trying to find that one piece of information that is novel and exciting to talk about. Yeah, and it's and that that's the thing. I mean, there are some people that we've caught lying, but there are so many more. But the thing is, there's so much, there's so much middle ground between lying, um, between just full on lying and being completely honest. Where, you, yeah, I've seen I've seen it happen firsthand. You can kind of like, you can tell yourself a little bit of a story why just p hacking just this much is acceptable. You know, let's say like outliers are a great option for this. You have a data set with some outliers. You look at the outlier. Is this outlier throwing your data off in a, because you know you have the option as a scientist and in some cases you you probably should throw an outlier out because they are ruining the uh, experiment. You know, let's say somebody comes in drunk and you know makes a fool of themselves and just completely throws off the experiment. You might want to throw that person out, but you can always just kind of look at outliers that may be skewing your data in a way that you don't like, and you can look at them and kind of with a fine tooth comb, like, is there anything that would justify exclusion? 
is this really justified? And, you know, you can tell yourself a story about, yeah, I should kick this guy out because this, this, or, you know, this or that. So there's a lot of opportunity between, there's a lot of like middle ground between like, I know I'm lying. I'm just, I'm doing what I need to do to make print. And I'm being completely honest where you can kind of increasingly tell yourself, you know, stories and still feel like you're basically doing the right thing, but I'm, maybe I'm not sure about that, but I, you know, I, overall I'm, I'm doing the right thing. And that's something that a lot of people don't realize that there's so much opportunity for that because it's, the system is based on trust so much and it's based on trust. And yet there's so much incentive to just get a certain result. I mean, a lot of this stuff was based on the assumption. I, mean, I think a lot of the early scientists were like, you know, Charles Darwin, he was just independently wealthy. He had nothing to do. Um, he was just going out and doing, doing science because he was a wealthy noble. And I'm not saying we should have, we should bring back you know, wealthy nobles, but a lot of the assumptions of science were based on someone who did not have to, who was not relying on the, the product of science to make rent and feed their family, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not trying to say on the exercise science side, there's anything fishy going on. Cause I think the majority of the people in there are for the right reasons and they're trying mm -hmm. to progress. I think that the, what's important is on the consumer side of things, be, being able to interpret what it is and how you can leverage it and what to take as fact and what to take a little bit more skeptical than others. I think that's, oh, yeah. that's what it's more about is thinking critically as opposed to, you know, the assumption that people are, are trying to do wrongdoing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I, I, that, that is, yeah. I'm not trying to say they're all out there with bad intentions. I just think, um, and like I say, like the experiences I'm sharing are more with other fields where I think, again, it's not bad intentions, just kind of like, being up against the wall, but yeah, I think, I think with, um, I, I think with some other fields, it's more like, let me see what I can do to meet the standard. And I do think with exercise science, it's just like, let's just do what we can. And that's like, whatever we do, whatever we can do is the standard. Yeah. Um, so I don't think, I, I, I do think, and they do seem a little bit not, they don't seem, yeah, I don't, I don't get the impression, I could be wrong, but I don't get the impression that there's a lot of like fraud there. I, I just get the impression that instead of, pushing people into a situation where they might have to do fraud. They just like kind of like lower the standards to the point where they're maybe not meeting the standards that most other fields would consider to be basic. Awesome. So now I'm going to move things in a slightly different direction. I'm going to put in uh, a picture up on the screen and I'll say who it is and tell me what workout you would do with them in person. First one is Tom yeah. Platt. Oh wow, Tom Platts. I mean, it's gotta be squats. I that would be that would be so awesome. I mean, that would be squatting with Tom Platts would be crazy, but I, I would definitely do it. That would be awesome. And I know you're not someone who who thinks we need a lot of recovery, but you might need recovery after that. Oh so. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I that's the thing. I, I like recovery. I I I don't I don't train in like definitely if I was gonna do a Tom Platts squat workout, I'd need I'd need more than a week to recover. I, I train frequently, but it's that's distributed over a lot of body parts. Yeah, because I'm, you know, I'm trying to hit neck, I'm trying to hit calves, I'm, you know, all, all the stuff people skip, um, and just you know, give everything the detail that it requires. But I don't actually train each in, individual group that often. So yeah, oh, man, that would be fantastic to train. Yeah, train. I don't even care about. I don't even care about about my quads. It's it's not about the quads. It just be about that intensity. That would be awesome. All right, next one is GVS. Uh, I would definitely train arms with him. I'd I want to pick his brain on. I'd want to see every little detail of how he's doing the tricep stuff. Awesome. All right, we're gonna move over to Steve Reeves. Steve Reeves. Okay. What would I? Yeah, because I, I I disagree with something. It would it would still be arms. I mean, fantastic arms. You wouldn't try to uh, get him to do your trap workout because he's been neglecting it. Oh. I, I I tell him to yeah I, I think he would um I I don't know that he would want to do that though but yeah oh can I mean can you imagine like I'm hey you you know um what's this you know Serge Nubre have you seen pictures of Serge Nubre yeah uh you know competed against Arnold I mean I see him as being some a lot like what I think um, Reeves would look like because they both have that really narrow waist. But you know, Serge Nubre has really developed traps. I think if um, I think if Reeves actually developed a little bit more in the areas that he thought were unesthetic, I think he would have looked a lot like a Serge Nubre naturally. And you know, not to bash Nubre, but I mean, obviously, I know he had a great seat. I'm not I'm not bashing in any way, but obviously, he was a product of his time, right? 
Yeah, I think you can even see in this this picture, right? He has a fantastic physique, but you can't really see the traps. Yeah, that was that was by that was by design. I think you know, I think if he hadn't shied away from, um, and, you know, the guy was the guy was very strong, and he was do, he was for the things that he was trying to develop, he was he was a beast, but he was trying to avoid developing the midsection, the glutes, the traps, and I think I think he could have even backed on even more mass, and it wouldn't have ruined his aesthetics at all. I think it would have looked fantastic if he had um, not had those ideas. All right. And the last one here, if you could train with anyone from Lord of the Rings, who would it be? And oh, what would wow. you do? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I, I feel like the uh, anyone from Lord of the Rings, I mean. It's the hardest. Yeah, I, feel like, I feel like the best training partners would be. Yeah, Gimli and Legolas. I, I feel like that would just be a really good dynamic, a good opposition. I mean, can I train with both of them? Because I feel like there'd be just like so, so much opposition and pushing and just like you, different. You can abilities. you can train with both of them and you can hear their smack talk the entire time. I mean, you know, because you imagine you can imagine Gimli's going to dominate the bench press and squat, but then Legolas is going to be deadlift. It's going to be like deadlifting more. I, that would that would be fun. That would be a really fun environment. <laughs> Awesome. Dude, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Where can everyone find you? Um, it's pretty simple. Atlas Power Shrugged on Instagram, Atlas Power Shrugged on, U on YouTube. I'm trying to make a little push to improve the YouTube quality and frequency. And um, also my website, atlaspowershrugged.com, where you can buy my book. Awesome. Thanks for your time, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Great conversation, man. Thank you for having me on.